good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Welcome to Community Consolidated School District 93. My name is Bill Shields. I'm the superintendent. And we're very excited to host one of the Glenbard Parent Series offerings here. Um, Dr. Fry, Sharon Fry's works with Gilda, and we usually have three or four a year. We have typically a very good turnout during the day, so we're excited to see you here this afternoon. And as usual, the Glenbard Parent Series has just absolutely phenomenal speakers, national speakers that come in, and they have topics that are intriguing, interesting, and I know you're going to really enjoy hearing from Dr. Lauren Steinberg. I'm going to have Gilda Ross give you a little bit of uh, information about his background, and then we'll start our presentation. Gilda, can you come up? Um, and this is Jim Nelson. Jim's going to introduce Hi. himself. Yeah, so um, Jim Nelson, I'm the director for CASE. Uh, CASE is uh, seven school districts in DuPage County. We're the special education cooperative, and we partner with uh, Glenbard Parent Series and help support um, the program and bring in some great speakers. And thank you uh, for coming. This is great. Um, I want to just point your attention out to one that's coming up, Dr. Scott Bellini, on Thursday, February 4th. Scott has been with us three times before and does great behavior quirky, um, addresses behavior at home and in school, and really does a great job. So Scott Bellini is a great guy. His resources will be very valuable. So um, take a look at that, and uh, Gilda, it's Thank all you. yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just want to mention that Case is one of the major sponsors of the Glenbard Parent Series. So really, without Case, we couldn't have GPS. So I always thank you very so much. Yes. Yes. When you walked in, you should have an evaluation, and if you don't have one, um, we'll make sure that you get one. If you want to be on the reminder list, that's really important. Uh, please write legibly so we can keep you abreast of new programs, which we do add all the time. You have a blue flyer in front of you that does mention all the programs that are remaining for this year. Um, uh, Jim just talked about the program with Scott Bellini on social skills on the 4th, and there's a special event happening on the 6th. Um, that will be happening at Glenbard East. It's a Saturday. FAFSA completion workshop, one-on-one -on -one help for senior families. Also, a new program we're doing is called Moving On, The Road to Adulthood. What do you need to know as a parent? What does your senior need to know about helping them make this smooth transition to college? Um, and also a program in Spanish that day. And then that the blue flyer describes the next program coming up with Josh Ship. Please turn off your cell phones. We are in for a very special presentation, and I'm so glad you could be here. Lauren Steinberg, PhD, is the Distinguished University Professor and Laura Carnell Professor of Psychology at Temple University. He received his BA in Psychology from Vassar and his PhD in Developmental Psychology from Cornell. Dr. Steinberg is a former president of the Division of Developmental Psychology of the American Psychological Association and of the Society for Research on Adolescents, the former director of the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Adolescent Development and Juvenile Justice, and a member of the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience, an internationally recognized expert on psychological development during adolescence. Dr. Steinberg's research has focused on a range of topics in the study of contemporary adolescents, including adolescent brain development, risk-taking and decision-making, parent-adolescent relationships, school year employment, high school reform, and juvenile justice. He served as a member of the National Academy's Board on Children, Youth, and Families, and chaired the Academy's Committee on the Science of Adolescence. Dr. Steinberg was the lead scientist in the preparation of the American Psychological Association's amicus briefs submitted to the U.S. Supreme Court in Roper versus Simons, which abolished the juvenile death penalty. Yes. <laughs> Graham versus Florida, which banned the use of life without parole for juveniles convicted of non-homicide crimes. And Miller versus Alabama, which prohibited the use of mandatory life without parole for all juvenile crimes. Too many articles and books to mention, too many awards for us to mention as well. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Lauren Stone. <laughs> Let me just say before I start that I do a lot of speaking around the country in different places, and no one is better at organizing 
these events than the other losses. So the commission is really we're so lucky to live in a community that is so active in promoting good parenting and healthy child and adolescent development. It's a real treasure. Um, okay, so what I want to do this afternoon is to change the way that you think about adolescence. And you'll leave here, I hope, thinking about this period of life in a very different way than the way you think about it now. And I wrote Age of Opportunity because I think that this change is long overdue. American teenagers are not doing well compared to kids from other comparably industrialized, developed societies. If you look at comparisons of high school student achievement, our high school students typically rank at the bottom of the list compared to other similar countries. But we're near the top of the list in things like STDs, unintended pregnancies, illicit drug use, binge drinking, obesity, crime, and violence. So we're clearly not doing something right in the way in which we're bringing up our young people. Um, I don't know how we compare internationally on this, but I do know that today our teenagers and young adults in college report levels of anxiety and depression that have never been seen before in surveying young people. So I think we can add to the list of maladies that we need to think about um, what psychologists call internalizing disorders like anxiety and depression. I know that on our campus at Temple University, the counseling service is overwhelmed, as it is on most college campuses, um, from students who are um, not doing well. And we're seeing this in high school kids, too. Um, and we'll talk a little bit today about what I think some of the causes of that are, what we might do about it. I think the way we think about adolescence generally is that it's something to be survived. And I think that's how parents look at it, and I think that's how a lot of young people are taught to look at it. And if you go to a bookstore and you look in the section at books aimed at parents of teenagers, you will find a lot of these uh, survival guides. In fact, many, many of the best-selling books on adolescents that are aimed at parents have the word survive or survival in the title. If you were to go to the section next to that where they sell books on infants, babies, you will never see the word survive or survival in the title. Um, even though, and I say this as a parent, I really wondered whether I was gonna survive <laughs> our, our child's first few months of life. You know, the sleep deprivation and um, all the unfamiliarity you have and nervousness you have. And I never thought, that I wasn't gonna survive our son's adolescence. Um, and we had our share of problems. Um, and you know the knowledge that I have about the period as somebody who studied it for 40 years didn't prevent things from happening in our family that, that happen in most families. Um, you know, one of the things that kids often do is they try to pull away from their parents. And that's normal and to be expected. It's something that parents need to resist because you need to stay involved and connected to your child, regardless of what your child leads you to believe she wants you to do. And I can still remember one <coughs> evening when my wife and my son and I were sitting down to dinner. I guess he's about 14, 15 years old. And it was very important in our family to have dinner together um, every night. It's the time uh, you know, to catch up with each other. And on this particular night, Ben asked if he could take his dinner upstairs to his bedroom and eat there and do whatever he was gonna do, watch television, fool around with his computer, talk to his friends. And I said, you know, no, uh, this is the time of day when we find out about each other's day. When mom and I get to hear about how you spent your day and you get to hear how mom spent hers and how I spent mine. And he paused and he said, you know, dad, no offense, but I'm really not all that interested. He said, if, if you come into a lot of money, or if we're moving, I'd like to hear about it. But otherwise, you can just assume 
that I'm really not that interested in how your day was. So, you know, being an adolescent psychologist does not protect against <laughs> things like that. And I, and, I, and I will say, and I'll tell you a couple stories later, that um, I, I did learn a lot about adolescence as a parent of a teenager. And in fact, some of Marsan's escapades actually stimulated some of the research that we've ended up doing, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, so if, if we don't look at adolescence as a time to merely survive, how should we think about it? And I think that the science of adolescence, which is how I approach it, tells us that it's a time when people can really thrive, um, as long as we are able to take advantage of the opportunity. So I want you to leave here today, if you're the parent of a teenager or a teacher who works with kids in this age range, thinking about what can I do to help facilitate my child's positive development? And not only thinking about what can I do to prevent problems from happening. Because I think that when we approach anything in life as something to merely be survived, we don't invest very much in trying to make the experience better. Because we think what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold my breath until this is over. And as I said before, I don't think this is accurate, and I don't think it's very productive. So there are all sorts of reasons to think about this age period. Obviously, if you're the parent of a teenager, you want to know how to do it right. If you're a teacher who works with this age group, you want to understand their development and how to best approach them. But even if you're not in either of those positions, it's important to be concerned about young people because we all have a stake. All of us have a stake in making sure that the next generation of young people is happy and healthy and competent. So this is a concern that I think is a community-wide concern and not just limited to parents or, or teachers. And there's another reason to think carefully about how we raise people at this age. And that's that adolescence is longer now than it's ever been in human history. And it's been stretched at both ends. It's been stretched at the front end by the decline <coughs> in the age at which kids go through puberty, which has been quite dramatic. And it's been stretched at the back end by a delay in the transition that people make from adolescence into the roles of adulthood. So let me just say a few words about each of those trends. And it's really quite striking, I think. At the beginning of the 20th century, the average American girl got her first period when she was about 14 and a half years old. Today, it's about 12. <coughs> it has dropped considerably. And there's been a similar drop in the age of puberty among American boys as well. The average American boy today goes through puberty about two years earlier than his counterpart did um, as recently as the 1970s. So it has declined over the last several centuries, it's as long as we've been kind of tracking it, um, but it continues to decline. We think it's due to several different factors. Probably the most important is obesity. We know that children who have more fat on them go through puberty earlier than children who are leaner. And as I'm sure you know, there's been an epidemic of childhood and adolescent obesity in this country, and that has dropped the rate of puberty on average. The second is the exposure of our children to chemicals um, that disrupt their hormonal functioning and that mimic regular normal hormones, sex hormones, in a way that tricks the body into starting puberty early. Um, these chemicals, which are called endocrine disruptors, are found not mainly in food, as many people think, but they're in cosmetics um, and other kinds of products that we put on our hair and on our skin. Um, they're in pesticides, so they get into food that way. Um, and they're in plastics, not just plastic bottles that we drink water from, but plastics like the kind you're sitting on. Um, and so our, the exposure of our kids to these chemicals is ubiquitous and very hard to prevent. In Age of Opportunity, I have a list of chemicals to look out for so that if you're buying things like shampoo or skin lotion, you can 
find products that don't have these chemicals in them because they are not good for us and they're making our kids go through puberty earlier. And then the third contributor to this is the increased exposure of our kids to artificial light, particularly the light that's emitted from smartphones, and tablets, and laptops. I'm sure that you've read advice saying that you should not read from these devices before you go to sleep at night because they make it harder to fall asleep, and that's true. Um, but the way that they do that is by disrupting the melatonin system in your brain. Melatonin is the brain chemical that makes you feel drowsy, and there's an increase in melatonin as, um, uh, as the afternoon shifts into the evening as it gets darker outside, and that's why you start to feel sleepy um, the later it gets. These um, artificial lights trick your brain into thinking that it's not dark outside, and they interfere with the normal secretion of melatonin. But melatonin, it turns out, plays a very important role in the onset of puberty, too. And so these devices, when our children spend a lot of time in front of them, also disrupt normal maturation and accelerate it and make it take place earlier. So those are some reasons for the drop in the age of puberty. But adolescence is also lengthened, as I said before, because kids are taking longer to become adults. Um, the average 25-year-old today is, only, is, is twice as likely to still be in school as his parents' generation was when they were 25, and only half as likely to be married, and you won't be pleased to hear this, but 50% more likely to still be getting money from their mothers and fathers. So there's no question that adolescence is being lengthened in this way and that the entry into adulthood is being delayed. And when you plot it all out, as I've done, what you see is that adolescence now is a period that lasts about 15 years. And that's three times as long as it was in the 19th century and twice as long as it was in the 1950s. And I think that when adolescence was a short period of time, maybe it was okay to approach it as something to be survived. But now that it's 15 years, we need a different strategy and a way of thinking about it. And I think we can look to brain science um, to help us figure this out. So I want you to take 15 seconds now and just think back to your own teenage years and just try to conjure up some images of that. And I know that when I do, I find that I have more vivid and more detailed and richer memories of adolescence than of any other period in my life. So I'm in my early 60s now, and I can remember things that happened in 1967 when I was 15 years old better than I can remember things that happened to me last week. And this is odd because I had a very ordinary adolescence. I grew up in a suburb of New York that was not unlike where we are today. My family was sort of comfortably middle class. No one got sick during my adolescence. No one lost a job. We didn't move. There was no family disruption of any sort. One day led to the next, kind of as smoothly as riding a people mover in O'Hare Airport. Um, so there really isn't any special reason that I should remember adolescence so well, but I do. And probably you do too. Because research shows that most people remember adolescence better than any other time of their life. It's been studied pretty extensively. It's something that's called the reminiscence bump, because if you plot out um, on a graph when people's memories are most common, you get a little bump in the period from about 12 to 20 or so. Now, it had been thought for a while that the reason that we remember adolescence so well has to do with the nature of things that happen during this time period because a lot of memorable things take place during these years. Your first love, your first job, your first beer, maybe the first time you ever lived apart from your own parents. But this has been studied, and it turns out that that's not the reason for the reminiscence bump, because even mundane aspects of adolescence are recalled better than mundane aspects of other periods of life. And it's not just limited to personal events. 
If you think back to your own adolescence, I think that you'll find that the books that you read then, you remember better, that the movies that you saw then, you remember better, certainly the music you listened to then, you remember better. And it turns out that even the news events that we're exposed to during our adolescent years are recalled better than news events that take place during other points in life, which is very surprising because we don't think of teenagers as being especially attentive to the news. So if it's not the nature of the things that happen to us during adolescence, what is it that makes us recall it with such detail and richness? And the answer, it turns out, is the adolescent brain. The adolescent brain we're learning is exquisitely sensitive to experience. It's like the brain's recording device is set at a different level during adolescence than during other points in life. And this discovery about the adolescent brain, that it's so sensitive to experience, is part of a bigger story that I want to tell. And the story is about the incredible plasticity of the adolescent brain. Now, plasticity is a term that neuroscientists use to refer to the ability of the brain to be changed by experience. The brain is a plastic organ. It changes physically in response to the experiences that we have. But the brain is not plastic to equal degrees at different points in development. It's more plastic at some ages than others. You probably know that early in life, the period that we often refer to as zero to three, is a time when the brain is very plastic. And that's a reason that people have called for investing more in early childhood education and early childhood enrichment, and that's a good thing because the brain is very responsive at that age to this kind of enrichment. And that's been known for a while, but what hasn't been known until recently is that there's a second period of heightened brain plasticity in human development, and that period is adolescence. So we need to start thinking about adolescence more like the way we think about zero to three, about the potential to enrich development during this time when the brain is especially sensitive to and malleable by experience. As I'll explain in a little bit, um, the plasticity of the adolescent brain is a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways because it makes adolescence a time of opportunity when we can really help kids thrive by providing the right kinds of experiences but it also makes adolescence a period of vulnerability. Because the brain can't tell the difference between good experiences and bad experiences. And during adolescence, it's sensitive to all experiences. So it can profit more from positive experiences, but it can be harmed more by toxic experiences. So yes, our inclinations to try to protect our kids from harm <coughs> are correct. But what we need to add to that is a, just as strong an inclination to want to expose our kids to positive experiences that are going to help them develop. So I want you to abandon the idea that this is just something to survive and think about what you can do as a parent or a teacher to help the teenagers in your life thrive. Now, when the brain is plastic, uh, it changes in response to all kinds of experiences. And because we can continue to learn as adults, we know that some brain plasticity continues after adolescence. If your brain was not a little bit plastic, you couldn't learn anything. Because when you learn something and you retain that knowledge, it's because something has changed in your brain, physically. But there's a big difference between adult plasticity and what neuroscientists call developmental plasticity, that is, the nature of plasticity when the brain is still being built. During childhood and adolescence, your brain is making new brain circuits, new connections between neurons. And it's eliminating unnecessary circuits that get in the way of your brain functioning efficiently. Those processes are not happening now to you. They stop when adolescence ends. The kind of plasticity that takes place in adulthood 
is involves minor changes to existing brain circuits, not the development of whole new ones or the elimination of whole unnecessary ones. It's like the difference between remodeling your house and redecorating your house. When you're remodeling your house, you're putting on additions, you're knocking off rooms that you don't want anymore, you're putting in new wiring or plumbing, you're transforming where you live. When you redecorate your house, you're just changing the colors, curtains and carpets and furniture. So the brain is being remodeled during adolescence, but it's just being redecorated during adulthood. Why is this important? It's important because what it means is that adolescence is the last opportunity we have to really change the brain. I don't care what the infomercials tell you about changing your brain as an adult. The best you can do is tweak it once you're no longer in adolescence. But the brain can really be transformed before adulthood. So we need to think about how we can take advantage of that opportunity. Now when the brain is plastic, when it can be changed, it's not plastic in the same places at different ages. Some parts of the brain are plastic very early in life, and then they lose that ability. So a good example of that is the visual processing system in your brain. Right? You know when a newborn is born, it, can't, it doesn't have perfect vision. And that vision improves during the first year, year and a half of life. And then it stops improving. This is why you don't see any better ever than you did when you were a, a, a two-year-old. And that's because the part of the brain that processes vision loses its plasticity around that time. So it can't be changed anymore. Some aspects of the brain are plastic longer than that, but also not forever. Um, things like the part of the brain that, that drives learning languages. Right? So you probably know that it's much easier to learn a foreign language during childhood than it is after you've gone through puberty. And that's because the language learning part of your brain loses its plasticity at the beginning of adolescence. It's not impossible to learn a second language at that point in time or in adulthood, but it's very hard. Certain athletic abilities, for those of you who are athletically inclined, you probably know that it's very hard to learn how to ski as an adult if you never skied before. It's very hard to learn how to surf as an adult if you never surfed before, or how to hit a golf ball straight. But this is because we lose plasticity in parts of the brain that govern those abilities. Again, it's not impossible as an adult to learn to ski, but it's much, much harder than it is when you're five or six years old. So the part of the brain that's plastic during adolescence is the prefrontal cortex. That's the part right behind your forehead. Um, the prefrontal cortex is the brain's chief executive officer. It's responsible for all kinds of advanced thinking abilities, like planning and reasoning and weighing risk and reward. But it's also important for something else. It's important for self-control. Why do I want to stress this? Because if there's a single trait that's important to have in life, it's having strong self -control. We know this from hundreds and hundreds of studies, that kids who have strong self-control do better in school, they have more satisfying relationships, they're happier, they're less prone to develop mental health problems, they're less likely to get into trouble. And the fact that the part of the brain that regulates self-control is still plastic during adolescence is good news in the sense that we can do things to help kids develop this important trait. How important is self-control? Studies have found that it is a better predictor of how well kids do in school than intelligence. It's a better, it's a better predictor of how well people do on their jobs than talent is. This has been studied many, many times. So there's nothing that's more important to have for success in this life than a strong sense of self-control. How many of you have heard of the marshmallow study? Oh, good, a lot of you. 
So I'll just, for those of you who haven't, I'll, I'll talk very quickly about it. This is a study that was done about 50 years ago at Stanford where they looked to see which preschoolers when given the opportunity to either eat a single marshmallow or to wait about 15 minutes with the promise that they would get two, which preschoolers could wait? Some of the kids were able to do it just fine. Others ate that first marshmallow as soon as the tester walked out of the room. And other kids struggled with it. They had little tricks that they used. They sat on their hands or they closed their eyes in order to not be tempted by it. What's so important and interesting about that study is what's been learned by following these little kids over time as they grew up, and now they're um, in midlife. So the kids who were classified as delayers, the ones who could wait for the second marshmallow, turns out did better in school, had higher SAT scores, were less likely to develop problems that are related to poor self-control like obesity or substance abuse. They were less likely to be arrested. They got better jobs as adults. They made more money. This is just an illustration of how important it is to have strong self-control for success in life. And therefore, it's important for us to ask, as parents and educators, what can we do to help facilitate this in our kids. I want to talk now about some of the strategies that we can implement to do this. Let me first start by talking about schools. One of the activities that strengthens prefrontal function and therefore strengthens the brain system that supports self-control is exposure to novelty and to challenge. That's how the brain grows. The brain grows by having to do things it hadn't been asked to do before. And that's one of the reasons why our schools need to be challenging to kids and to expose them to new experiences and to new information and skills that they need to master. It's important not only so that to, for them to acquire that knowledge, but it's important because it strengthens this part of the brain, which protects them against problems that are linked to poor self-control. A second contributor to um, the development of prefrontal functioning turns out to be mindfulness training. So mindfulness meditation has been shown to improve self-control, has been shown to affect the physical functioning of the prefrontal cortex. And a lot of schools around the country now are incorporating mindfulness training, <coughs> meditation. You can do it through a variety of activities. Meditation is the most common, but you can also do it through things like yoga. Um, they've been incorporating these activities into the daily schedule of students because it does help them develop better prefrontal functioning and self-control. And that's a thing as a parent you can encourage your child to be involved in. A third important contributor to healthy brain development at this age is aerobic exercise. And it is really a shame that so many school districts have eliminated or cut back on physical education in order to make more time for, I don't know, testing. Um, and the reason it's a shame is that aerobic exercise brings blood to the brain and it helps the brain grow. And I would guess that most of the people in this room have some kind of exercise regimen that you try to follow on a regular basis. And you do that not only because it's fun and not only because it's good for your physical health, but because you realize it's also good for your mental health. So we treat ourselves to that as adults, but we don't ask our kids to do that anymore. And in too many schools around the country, daily aerobic exercise is something that is only done by the star athletes at the school. So another thing schools can do is restore that to the curriculum and to stop thinking about physical education as an add-on to the real 
education. Because I'm absolutely certain that we could spend less time on conventional subjects and use that time for physical education in schools and kids would learn more in the conventional classes than they currently are learning. Now, I talked about the importance of novelty and challenge in schools as a way of stimulating brain development. But we can overdo it. We can ask kids to do more than is reasonable to ask them to do. So the exposure to novelty and challenge has to be at the sweet spot between something that you haven't been asked to do before, but something that is within your grasp. And those of you who've taken psychology classes have probably been exposed to a concept called scaffolding. Scaffolding is when we present <coughs> a challenge or an activity to a child that's just beyond what the child is capable of doing, but within the child's reach. If it's not beyond what the child is capable of doing, it doesn't help stimulate brain development. You probably have read or heard that people need 10,000 hours of practice of something to develop expertise. That's true, but it hasn't been reported accurately. It's not 10,000 hours of doing the same thing over and over again. It's 10,000 hours that's invested in structured activity that gradually, slowly, gets a little bit more challenging over time. I've spent the last year and a half making presentations like this all over the country and some actually outside the country. And I hear a lot from kids and from parents about the amount of stress we're placing on adolescents in schools. And it's particularly true in relatively more affluent communities like yours. And I think that there's some confusion in the education community between challenging kids by piling on the amount of work versus challenging kids through the careful selection of activities that are scaffolded to help facilitate positive brain development. You don't need hours and hours of homework a day. And if the, the hours that you're spending on homework every day are doing the same thing over and over again, they are not doing anything to your brain. They are not helping your brain develop. So instead of taxing our children with so much schoolwork that they can't get enough sleep at night because we also ask them to devote too many hours each day to extracurricular activities. Um, we are not doing our kids any good. And I'm confident that the reason that we're seeing levels of anxiety and depression in our children where they are today is because we're stressing them in our demands for them. It is just simply unreasonable to expect a child to be perfect at everything. It is unreasonable to have that expectation. And it's driving our kids crazy. So we really need to rethink what we expect from our kids. I'm not suggesting we lower our standards. I'm suggesting that we think more carefully about the work that we assign our children to do in order to meet those standards. And it's not a question of quantity. It's a question of quality. Now let me turn to some of the things that parents can do, because I've already mentioned a couple of them. As a parent, you can make sure that your child gets adequate aerobic exercise. The teenager needs at least 30 minutes a day of aerobic activity, and hopefully closer to an hour a day. And if you look at studies that have track this in American kids, a lot of kids get adequate exercise when they're in elementary school. And then it just drops off as they move into middle school and, and certainly into high school. And that's not good for their physical health or their neurobiological health. A second thing to be concerned about as a parent is sleep. Your own sleep and your teenagers. I know it seems completely unrealistic to you to hear this, but a teenager needs about nine hours of sleep a night in order to develop in healthy ways. And we know that they're not getting that. 
But eight hours is better than seven, and seven hours is better than six. And inadequate sleep during adolescence is associated with poor self-control, poor prefrontal development, elevated rates of substance use and substance abuse, anxiety, depression, and poor school achievement. So it's really important <coughs> to make sure that our kids get adequate sleep to facilitate brain development as well. There are also things that we can do as parents in the way that we parent kids that contributes to healthy self-control. There's a style of parenting that I've written about in several books that we call authoritative parenting. Authoritative parenting combines being warm with being firm. And you need to do both. If you're warm, but you don't have rules and limits and expectations, you're parenting too permissively and your child's going to be not well off as a result of that. Your child may be happy that you parent that way, but it's not good for your child's behavioral development. If you're firm and you're strict, but you're not warm, that's not good either. This is the myth of tiger parenting, by the way, and, and why it doesn't work. Because that's a style of parenting that emphasizes strictness and firmness, but doesn't emphasize warmth. And studies show that when you raise children that way, it makes them anxious and depressed. And it doesn't make them do any better than if you're strict and warm at the same time. And that combination of being strict and being warm helps develop <coughs> better self-control. Well, let me say a little bit more about each of those aspects of authoritative parenting so that you know how to do it. By being warm, I mean a couple of things. I mean expressing your love for your child verbally and physically and frequently. I mean being involved in your child's life, not micromanaging your child's life, but being involved, attending the functions that the school puts on for parents, going to see your child in extracurricular events, knowing who your child's friends are, maybe making your house the place where kids congregate so that you get to know your child's friends even better, listening to your child genuinely, not just perfunctorily asking how was your day today, being involved in your child's life. So if you're warm and affectionate and involved in your child's life, you're giving your child one of the best gifts that you can possibly give that will pay off over the course of your child's life. But you have to be firm and have expectations and limits for your child's behavior as well. Kids need boundaries. Kids need limits. What those boundaries and limits and expectations are will change as your child gets older. But they should never disappear. Adolescents need limits set for them by their parents. But adolescents, because they're smart, need to understand why those rules and expectations are there. And so it's critically important that parents explain the reasoning behind the rules and the expectations they have. You can say to a three-year-old who asks why she should do something, just do it because I said so. It'll work for a, a little while. It won't work with a teenager. They're too smart for that. But what we find in our studies of parent-adolescent relationships is that when adolescents understand the logic behind a rule or an expectation, they're likely to comply with it. But they may argue with you about it. And sometimes, as a parent, you'll need to change what you're doing because your child will be right. And you should never be afraid of changing a rule or an expectation because your child points out to you that it doesn't make any sense and where you see that, yeah, you know, my kid is absolutely right on this. It teaches your child that your authority as a parent doesn't come from power. Your authority as a parent comes from wisdom. You can't turn disagreements with your teenager into a power struggle. Everybody loses when it becomes a battle to see who's really in control here. 
So as an authoritative parent, you explain what you do, and you listen to your child, and you respect your child's opinion about things. And if you can practice authoritative parenting, you can help develop self-control in your child, and that's going to help protect against a lot of problems. Now, I've wandered a little bit away from the adolescent brain. I want to come back to it now, because it's relevant to understanding the importance of self-control. Puberty affects the brain, and not just in ways that makes kids interested in sex. I mean, we think of puberty as something that changes the outward appearance, which it does, and changes our internal reproductive functioning, which it does, and changing our sex drive, which it does, but it also affects the brain. And this is a relatively recent discovery. One of the reasons that the brain becomes more plastic in adolescence is because of the impact of pubertal hormones on brain development. That's why there's this second surge of brain plasticity at this age. But puberty also affects the brain in another very important way that helps us understand why adolescents behave the way they do. Puberty, and pubertal hormones specifically, increase activity in the brain involving a neurotransmitter called dopamine. I'm sure you all have heard of dopamine. Dopamine serves a lot of purposes in the brain, but one of the most important is our experience of pleasure. And when we anticipate something rewarding or pleasurable, and when we experience something rewarding or pleasurable, we get a little dopamine squirt in the brain. And that's what makes us feel good from the expectation or the experience. And that dopamine squirt comes from anything that is rewarding or pleasant. It comes from sex. It comes from food. It comes from money. It comes from praise. During adolescence, it comes especially from the admiration of one's peers. They all activate the same reward center in the brain. And this reward center is so easily aroused during adolescence that there's more dopamine activity in the brain at this point in development than at any other stage of life. One of the things that this does is it makes things that feel good feel even better. And the sad news for us in this room is that nothing will ever feel as good to you for the rest of your life as it did when you were a teenager. Because dopamine activity declines in the brain's reward centers as we move from adolescence into adulthood. But one of the things that dopamine activity does to the adolescent brain is it makes kids especially attentive to rewards that are out there in the world, and especially inclined to go after them. And so we see a big increase in what a psychologist we call sensation seeking during adolescence, going after experiences that are exciting and that have the potential to pay off big rewards, even if there are some dangers or risks involved. And the problem is that when this arousal of the brain's reward centers takes place, the teenage brain is still at a point where the prefrontal cortex has not matured yet. That takes a long time to happen. That isn't over until people are 22, 23 years old. And so adolescence is a period during which the accelerator is pressed down to the floor, but there isn't a good braking system in place. And that's another reason why it's so important to try to facilitate the development of strong self-control. Because if we look at health during adolescence, what we see is that the leading causes of problems during adolescence are not disease and illness. We've done a great job there. The leading causes of disability and death during adolescence are behavioral, the things that kids do. And every type of risk taking has its peak during some point in the adolescent years. Crime, reckless driving, cutting, attempted suicide, experimentation with drugs, binge drinking, sexual risk taking. This is all higher during adolescence than at any other point 
in development. And one of the reasons is this mismatch between this very easily aroused reward center and a still maturing prefrontal cortex. So one of the things that you can do as a parent or a teacher in promoting prefrontal development is to help protect kids against following their inclinations to engage in risky behavior. And that will help ensure that kids are safer than they've been. Um, let me just say one final thing, and then we probably need to, what time do we need to stop? Okay, good. Um, so let me, let me talk a little bit about our approaches as educators um, in deterring kids from engaging in these risky behaviors. It's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and, and writing about. And I'm going to say some things that may bother some of you, but it doesn't worry me. Um, <laughs> we spend a lot of money, and I'm sure here in your school district you spend a lot of money on classes designed to discourage kids from sexual risk taking, from trying drugs, from smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Maybe here you have classes in driver education as well. Some places still do. And evaluations of these classroom-based programs are not very encouraging. It turns out that these programs are very good at changing what kids know, but very bad at changing how they behave. If you understand adolescent brain development and this combination of reward-seeking and immature self-control, you understand why these programs are not very effective in changing kids' behavior. Because the reason that kids engage in these behaviors that we don't want them to engage in is not that they're ignorant. In fact, if studies show that if you present kids with lists of potentially risky activities and you ask them to indicate how risky is this, how likely is it that something bad can happen to you if you do this, and so on, they don't score any differently than adults do. If anything, they're more likely to overestimate how risky things are than adults are. So we've done a really good job at giving kids knowledge about these activities, but they still engage in them even though they know what the risks are and they know that they shouldn't. Driver education has no effect on the degree to which kids drive safely. I know this because I learned it from Allstate. I served on the Allstate Foundation Teen Safe Driving Advisory Committee. By the way, it's a terrific website that this committee built on how to talk to kids about driving, on how to create a good contract between parents and teenagers who are about <coughs> to start driving. It's easy enough to find on the web. It's done by the Allstate Foundation. So I spent a lot of time talking to people who know about safe driving. And I can tell you that the evidence for driver education is non-existent. Kids who've gone through driver education don't drive any more safely than kids who haven't. In fact, there are some studies that show that they drive actually more recklessly because they become overconfident about their driving as a result of some of the courses that they take. Um, so I think it's important that we continue to give kids knowledge about what's risky but I don't think that we should kid ourselves into thinking that that's all we need to do. We need to do other things. And we need to think about the public health problem that is created by adolescent risk taking differently. And we need to stop trying to change kids into something that they're not going to become. And instead think about changing the context in which we raise our kids. There's a reason that adolescents take the risks that they do. And the reason is that the adolescent brain is wired for risk taking. And that makes perfect sense when we think about evolution. All mammals go through puberty. We can learn a lot about adolescents by looking at what happens in other species. And when juveniles in other species go through puberty, they leave. They go off into the wild. They leave behind the adult animals that raised them and that have been protecting them. 
may go off to find mates and to become independent. And that is a very risky thing to do because you're now, as a juvenile animal, competing with bigger, stronger, and more experienced members of your species. And we believe that the adolescent brain became wired to be more tolerant of risk taking in order to facilitate that process of becoming independent. Because if we were not inclined to take risks as adolescents, we would never have reproduced. My point is that there's nothing that you can do that's going to turn adolescents into people who don't take risks. It is built into the development of the adolescent brain. You can do two things, though, that will help. You can provide opportunities to engage in positive risk taking, because not all risk taking is bad. And that will satisfy some of the inclination that kids have, <coughs> positive risk taking, going out for a part in a school play that you're nervous about auditioning for, trying out for a sports team that you're not confident you can make, taking a more challenging class than one that guarantees that you're going to get A's. Going into a community service program where you're going to have to learn how to interact with and meet adults that are unfamiliar to you. There are all kinds of positive things kids can do that indulge their inclination toward risk taking. It doesn't have to be negative. And that's one thing that we can do. Another thing that we can do is to help structure the world that kids live in to prevent them from engaging in some of the risky behaviors that they do. Driver education, as I said, doesn't work. Graduated driver licensing has worked terrifically in Illinois and in other states as well. There's nothing about graduated driver licensing that tries to change adolescence. It's changing the context by making something illegal, like driving around with passengers in the car before you're capable of doing that um, successfully. The best intervention that we've ever had to reduce teen smoking in this country, which we have, thankfully, has not had anything to do with anti-smoking education. It had to do with raising the price of cigarettes so that they were outside the reach of many teenagers. That's when the big drop in teen smoking occurred. The risky things that kids do are done during a particular time period. They're done between 3 and 6 in the afternoon, mainly. They're not done always on Saturday nights. And they're not done in the back seats of cars or out on the football field. They're done in kids' own homes or in the homes of their friends when adults aren't around. So if we're serious about preventing experimentation with drugs and sex and delinquency, we need to figure out how to structure the time from 3 in the afternoon to 6 in the evening so that kids are in activities that are supervised by adults that are going to be fun and interesting and maybe even satisfy some of their needs for risk taking, but that are going to keep them with people who can watch them and supervise them. Because we know from years and years of research on adolescent development that unsupervised, unstructured time is a recipe for experimentation with problem behaviors during adolescence. And so we need to get our communities to invest more in after school programming for people of this age, which is absent in lots of the country. <coughs> not just for the stars on the varsity teams, not just for the few kids that get to you know, be in the school play, but for all kids. And I'm sure that if we had the resources to do that, we could lower rates of drug use and unprotected sex and delinquency much more effectively than through classroom-based education, which doesn't really change rates of these behaviors very much at all. And that's another example of changing the context rather than trying to change the kid. But my most important message to you today really is about changing the way that you think about adolescents. To encourage you to abandon the idea that 
The best you can do is survive it. Like, you know, going to a root canal where you think the best I can do is hold my breath until this is over. Um, that's not what adolescence is about. Adolescence isn't a problem. It's not a burden. It's not something to try to just get through. It's a time of tremendous opportunity because of the incredible malleability of the adolescent brain. And yes, it is important to try to protect the adolescent brain from being harmed by exposure to drugs, let's say. But it's just as important, maybe even more important, to take advantage of the opportunity that it gives us to stimulate positive growth, positive development, by giving our kids opportunities to be challenged in appropriate ways, opportunities to pursue risk-taking in safe and healthy ways, and to continue to stay involved and in touch with our kids because a close connection between a teenager and a parent is the best way to ensure that we protect kids from harm and increase uh, taking advantage of the opportunities that adolescence provides us. So thank you so much for being here today, and I'm happy to answer questions about anything I talked about or anything else about this period of life. so many times that she just keeps track of the things that I forget to talk about and then <laughs> pretends to be asking questions in these things, but I'm glad that she has done that. So um, let me say something about peers. I, I, I mentioned in passing when I talked about things that... No, but you're, you're asking, do you not hear those questions? Ah, I'll repeat it. Of course. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So... The, so the two questions that were asked were, first, can I talk about the role of peers in adolescent development? And second, can I talk about what we know about the effects of drugs on the developing brain? So let me start with the question about peers. I mentioned in passing when I was talking about the things that excite the brain's reward centers, that during adolescence, getting the admiration and acceptance of one's peers excites the reward centers more than that kind of activity does during childhood or during adulthood. We know this from lots of studies in which we've imaged kids' brains and looked at how their brains respond to getting criticized by their friends, um, which also activates brain regions that make us feel sad or upset, or how they feel about being admired by their peers, which activates these same reward centers. And one of the consequences of this is that when kids are with their friends, they pay even more attention to the possible rewards of a risky choice than they do when they're by themselves. I'll bet that most of you have had this experience either as a teenager or as the parent of a teenager, but our research has found over and over again that adolescents do dumber things when they're with their friends than they would ever do when they're by themselves. And we've been studying that now for 10 years to try to figure out why this is. And it's not, as most people think, just because their peers actively encourage them to do risky things. It's because when they know their peers are <coughs> near them, when they observe them, it activates their reward centers in their brain, and that makes them pay attention to what the rewards are that are out there in the world and not pay attention as much to what the downside is of, of taking risks. And we've shown this in a number of studies in which we've imaged adolescents playing risk-taking games on the computer, either with their friends just nearby, because we can't fit them all in the fMRI machine, their friends are nearby and they know that their friends can see their performance on a monitor um, versus when they're alone. And we see that kids take more risks when their friends are nearby 
and their reward centers light up more when their friends are nearby than when they're alone, and we don't see this in adults. Now, this doesn't mean that peers are inherently a negative influence on adolescents. They're not. Peers are a rewarding influence on adolescents. So the key for us as parents and educators is not to stop kids from being with their friends. First of all, we couldn't do it if we wanted to anyway. But to exert some influence over who those friends are. Peer pressure is not a bad thing. I know plenty of adolescent peer groups that put pressure on their members to do well in school. I know plenty of adolescent peer groups that put pressure on their members to not do drugs or to be involved in volunteer activities in the community. So the issue for parents is not to stop peer pressure. It's to help direct your child toward peer groups where the pressure is going to be to do things that you want your kid to do. You need to start this early. Um, and you start it by speaking up when your child is associating with people that you're not so fond about. And parents are too shy very often to do that. Now you can't start that when your child is 15. So it's important to start it early, and what that does is it implants in your child's mind the idea that whether my parents like my friends is important, because you're expressing that as a parent. And by the same token, praising choices of peers whom you like. So that's one thing you can do. A second thing that you can do is to help steer your child into activities they're going to bring her into contact with the kind of kids you want her to come into contact with. Believe me, there's a big difference between the kids your child is going to meet at 1 o'clock in the morning walking around the neighborhood and the kids that your child is going to meet at soccer practice. And so by steering your child toward activities where there are going to be positive peer influences, you'll take advantage of the fact that adolescents are inherently interested in pleasing their friends. You asked me to talk a little bit about drugs in the adolescent brain. Oh, social media plays into that. Yes. Peer pressure and isolation. Yes. Right. So um, I'm glad you asked that because I know it's on everybody's mind. The question is, how does social media play into this peer influence process? Well, there's no question for starters that the reason that kids engage in social media is to create impressions with their friends and with other people. Not so much with other people. It turns out that the, the research on this, and it's not a big field yet, but the research that we have on social media and adolescents is that most of the people with whom adolescents interact on social media are people that they also see and interact with face to face. That they're not interacting very much with strangers. Um, the data on how kids are affected by, by social media are very mixed. I think that the reports uh, uh, of social media and its impact on kids are far too negative and one-sided. Um, for some kids, it encourages them to engage in activities that we don't want them to engage in. I mean, you can find social media sites that explain how to cut your wrists if you want to cut your wrists. Um, but for other kids, social media are, uh, can be a source of information like where to get help if you feel depressed about something. For some kids who are um, humiliated or bullied through social media, they're a problem. But that's the minority of kids. Most kids feel good about what they read about themselves on social media because most of what people are saying about them is positive. For some kids, social media um, becomes a, a, a complement to their face-to-face -face interactions with people. The way that the telephone was a way of communicating with people that were your friends that you couldn't see in the evening. Um, so lots of kids use social media the way previous generations used the telephone. For some kids, social media is a way of them maintaining social relationships and overcoming anxiety and shyness about interacting with other people. So it's served a positive purpose for some of those kids. So it seems to me that asking how social media is affecting adolescents without being more specific about what is going on is like asking 
how television affects kids without differentiating between Masterpiece Theater and Jersey Shore, right? I mean, and so I, th I think it's complicated. And if you're interested in this, and you'll remember this title, the best book that's ever been written on adolescence and social media is a book called It's Complicated, <laughs> right? Um, it came out about three years ago, and it's terrific. And it, and it really explains why it is so complicated. To, to me, the, the, the thing to worry about, which I think some parents do, but not enough of them do, is not what your child is doing on the internet, but how much time your child is spending in front of screens. So what you should ask yourself is, what is my child not doing because he's spending so much time playing video games? I'll tell you, the, uh, people don't believe this, but it is really true. There's no evidence that playing violent video games causes kids to be violent. My concern about violent video games is the same concern I have about all video games, which is that it's simply not healthy for kids to spend five hours a day in front of a screen where they need to be you know, doing things that are more intellectually challenging, getting exercise, or sleeping. So I would worry about the time my child spends engaging in social media more th in some ways than the content. Let me come back to the drugs in the brain question. Um, and then, uh, then you get a chance. Um, so the part, of the, so uh, the part of the brain that responds to recreational drugs, tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, opioids, the part of the brain, did I say alcohol too? The part of the brain that responds to these substances is also plastic during early adolescence, which means that exposure to these substances in large amounts or over a long period of time can permanently affect the way this part of the brain functions. And one of the things that happens when you use these substances for a long enough period of time, and I'll come to what I mean by that in a moment, one of the things that happens when you use these substances is that you get the dopamine squirt, right? And the hard part about getting kids to not use drugs is facing the fact that drugs feel good. If they didn't feel good, we wouldn't use them. But they feel good because they lead to dopamine activity in the brain's reward centers. And what happens when you use these substances repeatedly is that your body cuts down on its production of natural dopamine because it's monitoring how much dopamine is in your brain in order to regulate that. And when you're getting a lot of this dopamine because you're using these substances, your brain reasons that it doesn't need to manufacture more dopamine. And when you cut back on the amount of natural dopamine in the brain, you have to then create it artificially by using these substances. And when you can imagine this process unfolding over time, this is what creates addiction. It creates addiction because your brain needs the substances in order to feel normal. That's what happens over time. When adolescents experiment with these substances, early in adolescence, roughly speaking before the age of 15 or so, because the system of the brain is still plastic, it increases by tenfold the probability that they will develop an addiction later in life compared to people that use the same amounts of these substances but don't start using them regularly until they're 21 years old. And we also know this from animal studies in which animals are randomly assigned to be exposed to these substances right after puberty and compared to those who are randomly assigned to be exposed to them as fully grown adult animals. And the ones exposed right around the time of puberty develop addictions to the substances. So it's very important to understand that early use of these substances is very, very damaging in a permanent way to the adolescent brain. Now, whenever I give this talk to kids, they want to know, well, how much is too much? And how much use is regular use? Um, and the answer is, we don't know because it differs from person to person. People differ genetically in their vulnerability to these substances and in their vulnerability to addiction. 
and therefore you don't know if you're a 14 year old whether you've got the genes that are going to make you susceptible to developing addiction or whether you don't. You can look at your family history and that'll give you some clues, but it won't be a perfect answer. And so the best answer is that you shouldn't be using these substances at a point in your development where your brain is still so plastic. You had a question. Psychologists, we love to name things. So this has a. This is now called Facebook depression, um, and it is um, it is a um, you know a phenomenon that comes exactly from this from monitoring. You know, it's called Facebook depression because it was coined before there was Instagram, but it's the same thing. Um, monitoring these social media and feeling left out by things, and it's important to let your kids know that there are lots of things that they're included in that other people aren't included in and that they shouldn't just pay attention to the times when they see something that they haven't been a part of and they, because they should be balancing that by paying attention to the times when they see things that they are a part of. And we all have to learn in life that not everybody is a member of our fan club, right? And that is, you know, it's an unfortunate lesson for kids to learn, but it's real. And we all know that as adults. And so I agree, you have to help your kid develop thicker skin. I'm going to depend on you, Gilda, to watch the clock and decide when we need to wrap up. So the question is, are all adolescents inherently unreasonable? <laughs> Quite the contrary. So, th so the, the, the elaboration of the question um, involves talking to your kid about something, saying, look, there's research on this, this, and this, and why aren't you following this? If I had a nickel for every adult that didn't follow the research findings that they read about, I'd be a really wealthy person. So what you're describing in your daughter is not unique to adolescents at all. It's the way that we all are when we want to deny the truth of something because it's going to make us change in a way that we don't want to change. Um, one thing that you can do, first of all, is point out to her that she might feel good on six hours of sleep a night, but she'll feel even better with eight. Um, another thing that you can do I'm, I'm just speculating here, but I think it would probably work a little bit better, is that if she sees this information, you know, written down by somebody else, other, not told to her by her mom, she might be a little bit more willing to accept it. Now, maybe not in your daughter's case. But to go back to the initial question about whether kids are inherently unreasonable, no. The problem that parents encounter when their kids become teenagers um, is that they become better arguers. That's the problem. Um, and they're better able, because kids have acquired the logical reasoning capabilities of adults by the time they're 15 years old. The age groups don't score any differently on tests of logical reasoning. And that means that you can't get away with bluffing anymore when you're having a discussion with your child. And so 
it seems to me like it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say to you. Well, I mean, those studies, they're not studies of every single person in the world, and I may be different, and I feel fine on six. And tell you what, Mom, if my grades <coughs> start to go down, we'll reconvene the discussion about whether I should be getting more sleep. But until then, I'll handle it. You know, I mean, that's not an unreasonable thing to say. Two or three more. Two or three more. Okay. You had your hand up first, and then you. Yeah. And there seems to be a lot written now about how the guys don't want to quote unquote grow up as in previous generations. I'm just very curious to hear what you think is going on there. Yeah, so the question is, what do I think is going on with nineteen to twenty five year old males in, in particular in terms of media reports that they don't want to grow up and what's going on with them? Um, it's complicated <laughs> but <laughs> by by a couple of things. The first is that at all ages that we have studied in our research, and we've studied, we focus on people between 10 and 30, at all ages, males are less mature than females, um, consistently. They have poor self-control, and they're much more likely to engage in sensation seeking. And I had thought before we started this work, and we've done these, these studies now in 11 different countries, I thought before we started this work that males were slower to develop, but they would catch up, but we don't see any catch up. <laughs> um, I think most women know that, but, but as a guy, I was you know, optimistic that we might catch up. Um, I, you know, look, being 20 today is not the same as being 20 a generation ago. The world has changed. And I think it's really important, and I write about this a lot in Age of Opportunity, that we don't evaluate our young adults' behavior based on the timetable that we followed when we grew up. Because we grew up in a different world with a different economy and different requirements for education and a different labor force. I mean, who knows what we would have been like if we were looking out at the Great Recession and worried about what we were going to be able to do with our lives. I don't subscribe to the belief that kids that are taking longer to grow up are choosing that because they're lazy or because they've been spoiled. There is no evidence for that. I think they're taking longer to grow up because it takes longer to grow up today. Because you have to stay in school longer to get a decent job and that means you're going to be dependent on your parents longer. Um, having said that, I think it's important to evaluate your young adult in terms of whether, you're, whether he or she, for that matter, seems floundering or just seems to have a plan that's just slow to kind of unfold. I mean, if I had a young adult child who was living at home, as many of them do now, um, and, and, and in some cases happily, and there's nothing the matter with that. I mean, there's nothing the matter with young adults being close to their parents. Mm -hmm. um, but if I had a young adult who was living at home and he was spending you know, his days lying on the couch watching, you know, cat videos on YouTube, <laughs> I, I would say this is not an appropriate way to spend your time. But if he was doing something that was advancing his plan for a career, um, I would feel fine about it. So I, I think you just need to judge the behavior of young adults today by today's timetable, not by last generation's timetable. You have the last question. I don't want to Uh -huh. And so how does that, it's a very gray area for me to know when I'm pushing it too much, it's stressing them out. Yeah. So, you know, because people write that I know I just push them a lot harder. But, you know, so I don't know how that's exactly the same. Um, the answer is how to judge how much to push a child with high-functioning autism. Um, I don't know the answer to that. It's not an area that I have expertise in, and I try to limit you know, what I talk about the stuff that I know the literature on. So, sorry. I think we need to wrap up. Yes? Okay. All right. Oh, let's do this later. And then we'll okay. <laughs> All right.
Sure. Sure. So the question, well, the, the, the question is about the, the lasting effects of substance use, even if it's not addiction. Um, sure, we know, we know a lot about that. Um, so where we see the biggest effects on the brain are in regions that, that are important for memory, um, the hippocampus in particular, um, and for um, prefrontal cortical development, the part that regulates self-control. So it becomes kind of a vicious cycle. So to the extent that poor self-control contributes to kids using drugs, using drugs further contributes to poor self-control. And the, the, you know, the, the, lo the long-term studies find that kids who, and, and the best data we have are from studies of marijuana and alcohol, is that kids who use those substances regularly and chronically show impaired intellectual functioning um, in, into young adulthood that's probably not recoverable. Now, it may just be you know, five IQ points, which isn't gonna ruin your life, but there's no question that it does impair your memory um, and, and your thinking. The other issue, of course, is that when you're under the influence of these substances, you're much more likely to engage in other kinds of behaviors that are gonna hurt you, like reckless driving, you know, like unprotected sex, like violence and aggression. So I don't just worry about the long-term consequences, I worry a lot about the short-term consequences because, as we all know, these substances impair our judgment and our ability to exercise self-control. So I would worry about that too. This man spoke at 8 a.m., spoke at noon, speaking tonight for the Hinsdale uh, families, and that's open to anyone. So a big round of applause. Thank you.